Today, Pastor Javen continues the series, In It, Not Of It. As we go into this next season of Daniel, we see a prophetic future that's history to God. Things can sometimes feel hopeless, but we can know that we always have hope in the God who is sovereign over it all. So take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. Have you ever had to explain something that was really difficult to explain? <laughs> if, uh, if you have children, uh, or you ever work with children, the answer to that question is yes, I'm sure. Because kids always seem to ask us questions that we're like, really? Why'd you ask that? Um, so we're going to continue uh, in our series today, In It, Not Of It. We're continuing in the book of Daniel. And we're getting into a section of Daniel that's uh, not necessarily the easiest to try to explain. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, we, you know, we love the first section of Daniel, chapter 1 through chapter 6. I mean, uh, that we love the stories, the encouragement that comes from that because we read those and, and we see the, uh, the way that God just works and moves in Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We see the way he works through them in Babylon as they have been taken captive uh, as exiles. And, and, and we're just, we celebrate what God does through them. And then we get into chapter 7 and we're like, man, this is difficult. Because the first half of the book of Daniel is, is giving us a history of what happened with the exiles and Daniel and these guys. The second half of the book of Daniel is prophetic. It's Daniel looking forward to what's going to happen. But now for us, the interesting thing about the second half of Daniel is it's not only prophetic, but it's also historic. Huh? Right? So... We're going to look at that. We're, we're going to dive into this. And I know some of you are extremely eager to get into the second half of Daniel because you know how closely the second half of Daniel relates to what we read in the book of Revelation. And you love the book of Revelation. You want to know all you can know about the book of Revelation. And so you're excited about it. But I want to remind you of some things that I said this from the very beginning of the series. Just like we can't read Daniel 1 through chapter 6 and think, I've said this several times, if we do the right thing, God will keep anything bad from happening to us. That's never been God's promise, okay? His promise is that he's always with us. And, and, and we see in the first chapters, chapters 1 through chapter 6, we see that we serve God because he is our only hope that we can have to serve. And we serve God even if Everything in our life doesn't play out the way we wish it would play out. But he is our only hope. The point from the very beginning we said is that when we look at the book of Daniel, we realize we can live out our faith in a secular world that is opposed to our faith. And not only that, we can live out our faith in a way that can become contagious, that can become magnetic and can attract people to our God and see their heart and their life Transformed. So just like we can't read the beginning of Daniel in those ways, we can't look at the second half of the book of Daniel and try to look at these different things and pinpoint the exact day that Jesus Christ is going to come back again. And I know there's a lot of people that's got a lot of charts that are trying to figure that stuff out. There's a lot of people that's been predicting the end time and when Jesus is going to return for, for a long time now. And none of them have gotten it right yet. Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour. Now we look at this and we read the second half of the book of Daniel. We read the book of Revelation to find that our hope is in the sovereign God. That he is in control, that he is over all, that nothing takes him by surprise. So what we do is we live every day of our life as if any day could be the day. And we trust him because we know he's got it in his hands. What we see all throughout the book of Daniel is that in this world there is a pattern. But in God there is a promise. And so we can have, we can live out our hope, we can live out our faith, and we can have a hope in this world, even when the world around us may be opposed to the gospel. But as we move into the second half of the book of Daniel, my goal in my heart is to try to help us see that there's a pattern, but in God there's a promise. All right? There's things in these chapters that scholars debate. It's basically around the times and the numbers and the years and all that kind of stuff. But there's one thing that all scholars agree upon, and we're going to get to that in a moment. So what I'm going to try to do is navigate in my finite human understanding, which isn't a whole lot. <laughs> Why'd you laugh? To get us to understand there is a pattern, but in God there is a promise. 
Now, one of the, I heard an illustration, somebody give an illustration to describe how we get through this. And I thought, yeah, that's a great illustration because I, I'm aware of this place. I don't know if you've ever been to Disney World, Disneyland, any Disney park, you've ridden It's a Small World, or you know about that ride, all right? I thought this is a great illustration because you get on that ride and you're in it and there's, you know, there's all kind of sights, there's all kind of sounds, there's all kind of things all around you, all kind of, you got these big pink elephant. You got all these different looking animals, all these different looking things, and you're going through it and your kids are looking and you're sitting there thinking there's this one dominant song playing the whole way through. And if you would just hold tight, sit in your seat in that boat, eventually that river is going to get you out. All right. And so that's what we're looking at with the prophetic and what we're seeing take place in the end of the world. There's one dominant song being played over it all. So if you just sit tight, that river's going to get you out, all right? You just sit there. You don't know what all is going on around you. You just sit tight. Eventually, you'll get to the end of it. Now, one thing we need to understand about biblical prophecy, okay, when it comes to bi- biblical prophecy, there is a near fulfillment in most all of biblical prophecy, and there is a far fulfillment, okay? Now, for our Sesame Street fans, there is a near? Far, right? I grew up with Sesame Street. And that's how I remember things. But anyway, so there's a near fulfillment. That's just for your entertainment this morning, because this is difficult stuff. So there's a near fulfillment. There's a far fulfillment. Uh, it it kind of picture, kind of think of it in a mountain range, okay? Jenny and I went to Blowing Rock earlier this year, beautiful area. There's an area when you go up on the Blowing Rock and you're looking out over, this, over all these mountains and it just looks like one huge mountain with a bunch of different peaks. But right there in front of you, there's this uh, picture of all these mountain ranges and it points out what the name of each of those mountains are. And it's all a bunch of different mountains separated by miles, and you're looking at it, it's like, it looks like one big mountain. But when you look over the top of it, you realize it's all spaced out. It's all separate. It's all different. This is what we're looking at in biblical prophecy. And what we have to understand also is what we see as prophetic, God sees as history. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. He's not on the timeline. He surrounds the timeline. All right? So he, he knows everything that's happening and everything that is going on. So we're going to jump in. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8 today. Don't fret. We're not going to read the whole, all, all those two chapters, okay? There are a couple of verses that I do want us to look at it real quick. Daniel chapter 7, verses 15 and 16 are two of them. Let's look at those real quick. I, Daniel was troubled by all I had seen. That gives you comfort, right? The visions were, they terrified me. Awesome. That's fantastic. All right. So then verse 16. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and I asked him, this is key. He asked, he got a revelation and he asked someone, what does it mean? Then in Daniel chapter eight, where he's having another vision, another dream, same two verses in Daniel eight, verse 15 and 16. As I, Daniel was trying to understand what that word, what that phrase literally means is he was pursuing and understanding. He was seeking and understanding as he was trying to understand the meaning of this vision. Someone who looked like a man stood in front of me and I heard a human voice calling out from the Uli river, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. This is very important for us. Daniel received a word and then he sought for a revelation. This should be something that we all do at all times, especially when we are studying the word of God. We read the word, we study the word, and we seek a revelation of the word. Jesus, when he was with his disciples, he told his disciples that he could not stay. He had to leave. And it was actually good for them that he left. Because when he leaves, there was a, the, the spirit, the Holy Spirit was going to come. In John chapter 14, John chapter 16, he tells us that spirit was going to remind them of all things that he had taught and that spirit would guide them into all truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So the spirit was given to God. If you want to understand God's word, he gives you the Holy Spirit to help illuminate and bring revelation to what you are reading. So read his word, study his word, and pray about receiving the understanding of that word. My desire is every time that I preach to you is that I hope I encourage you to have more of a longing to to read the word of God and to see what the word of God is saying. My prayer is that as you do that, the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate more about his word and give you greater revelation about his word. Now, in that opening text in 1 John, John, he keeps going in that writing, and he tells them, he says, look, he said, 
You've received an anointing. You've received an anointing from the Holy Spirit. You've received a Holy Spirit that can help you understand. And he says these words. He says, in fact, you don't need a teacher. Now, what John is saying there is John is not saying you don't need to listen to people teach about the word of God because John was a teacher, okay? So he's not gonna tell people don't listen to me. Paul, who was an apostle of Jesus, uh, uh, apostle of Christ, he, he spread the good news of the gospel. He wrote in his writings when he wrote about the Holy Spirit that teaching was a gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul himself used the gift to teach. But here's what John is saying about when we have the Holy Spirit, he helps us in that regard. In that regards. The Holy Spirit gives us an understanding. He gives us a will, a, an ability to discern teaching so that we can see when a teaching is being twisted especially when it's being twisted by one who has the spirit of Antichrist, which is important for where we're going today. Now, I want to remind you, in Daniel chapter 2, if you've been here, been a part of this series, remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Daniel interpreted that dream. His dream was about a statue, had a head of gold, chest and arms of uh, silver, uh, hips and waist of bronze, legs and feet of uh, iron and clay mixture. You remember, maybe you remember that. And in the first six chapters, Daniel is interpreting dreams. The next six chapters, 7 to 12, Daniel is the one receiving the dreams and the vision. So we remember that dream that he interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, now we get to where he's having these dreams and he's having these visions. In Daniel's dream in chapter 7, he sees four different things similar to what Nebuchadnezzar saw, four different things. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that those four different things he was seeing on that statue, they were all talking about empires that would come one right after the other to overtake the other empire. Okay? Daniel chapter 7, he sees four different animals. All right? We're going to talk. We're going to look at them. Four different animals. They show him four different types of kingdoms. Daniel chapter 8, we see a little bit more about two of those empires. Daniel chapter 7 shows us that just like Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2, there's one rock that comes and destroys them all. Daniel chapter 7 shows us that there's one voice that brings an end to it all. Daniel chapter 8 shows us that what, that God is the only one that can bring down what man cannot. Okay. So we also need to know this about Daniel and Daniel's life, where he is in his life right now. If you were here last week, you watched last week, I told you in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel was somewhere in his 80s. This was under the reign of Darius in, in the Mede Persian Empire. When you jump into Daniel chapter 7, you see that it says, in the first year of the reign of Belshazzar. So what Daniel's doing is this prophecy that he is pointing out, it's going back. It's going back to the one who took leadership. He came after Nebuchadnezzar, somewhere down the line. Daniel chapter 5 was the end of Belshazzar's reign. So what we need to know is Daniel chapter 7, he's somewhere in his late 60s. Daniel chapter 8, he's somewhere around 70. And the visions that Daniel is describing in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 actually are given to him before what happens in Daniel chapter 5. Everybody with me? (laughs) Isn't this fun? Right? I mean... Okay, so, so he, gets, he gets these visions. First vision, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel sees a vision. Oh, you need to know this. Animals in, in, in prophetic imagery are typically metaphors for world kingdoms, all right? This is common in biblical prophecy. We see it throughout. So Daniel chapter 7, we get it. First vision he sees. First thing he sees is a, is a lion with wings, all right? He's got a lion with wings. Now, in this vision, the wings get torn off. The lion gets stood up on its feet like a human. It's given a human mind, all right? So first vision, he's got a lion with wings like eagles. Second vision, he has a vision of this really big bear. And the bear's standing more on one side. He's got three ribs in his mouth, and he's told to go and devour. Okay? Then we see a third image, or Daniel sees a third image. This third image that he sees is like a leopard. But this leopard has four wings on it. And the leopard also has four heads on it which are given, showing dominion that it holds. And then lastly, we see a beast that's not named that looks like any animal. This rendering that you see is just someone's rendering. It's an indescribable beast, really. It's not described in any type of way other than it's huge. It's a beast. It's frightful. It's dreadful. It's incredibly strong. It has teeth like iron. It devours. It crushes and it tramples over everything in front of it, all right? And it said that it had 10 horns on its head. 
So this is what we're seeing in this fourth beast. Then Daniel goes into Daniel chapter 8. Do you understand now why Daniel's a little terrified about what he's seeing? He goes into Daniel chapter 8. He sees two animals. The first one is a ram. This ram has horns on its head. One horn is a lot longer than the other horn, okay? Then he sees this really swift, fast-moving goat that's running so fast, its feet don't even touch the land. That's what Daniel says. Some of you are thinking, what was Daniel eating, drinking before... And he comes across the land. He's got one large horn poking out of his head. And he comes across the land so fast, he attacks the ram, and he destroys the ram. He devours the ram. And eventually that horn breaks off, and there's four horns that grow out of that one horn. All right, so let's attempt to put all this together. Even Daniel chapter 2, okay? We start with a head of gold in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 7, we've got a lion with wings. This is talking about the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel even told Nebuchadnezzar in his interpretation, the kingdom, the gold that you see, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar, that's the kingdom of Babylon. Now, when you looked at, if you look at Isaiah chapter 5, when Isaiah is prophesying about the uh, exile and prophesying about Babylon overtaking Judah, he uses the lion to describe this taking place in the imagery of a lion. If you were to go in through the Ishtar gates in the kingdom of Babylon, when you walk through the Ishtar gates, you would see this image of a lion that had wings. If you, uh, if you, there's different museums around the world that display this symbol that was on the Ishtar gates and was across the kingdom of Babylon, this lion with wings like eagles or, or, or with wings on it, right? So, so you've got this, and, and then when Daniel talks about seeing this lion and the wings pulled off, set, stood up on its feet like a man, given the mind of a man, this reminds us of what happened in Nebuchadnezzar when he lost his mind like a wild animal, but then his mind was restored. All right, so the next thing we go to in, Dan, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is silver, and we have uh, a ram. No, we have a bear standing on one side, and we've got a ram with two long horns. Now, what this is representing is this is representing the Mede and the Persian Empire. It's two empires. The reason that the ram, the the bear is standing on one side, the one horn is longer than the other horn, is because the Persian Empire was greater than the Mede Empire. The Persian Empire eventually overtook the Mede Empire. And remember, Daniel is seeing this vision. He had heard Nebuchadnezzar's dream and vision. Actually, God had given it to him so he could tell it back to Nebuchadnezzar, then interpret it. So he had seen that. He had had his visions of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8 before the hand wrote on the wall and told Belshazzar, your days are numbered, you've been weighed, and your kingdom is about to be divided. So Daniel had seen this playing out before it actually happened, right? Now, next we go into the bronze that Nebuchadnezzar had in his stone, and we go into a leopard with four heads, and we've got a really fast goat <laughs> with one big horn, all right? Um, what this is talking about is this is talking about the Grecian Empire. And the reason it's a leopard and the reason it's a really fast goat is because it's talking about how quickly the Grecian Empire overtook all the other empires in the known world at that time. The reason we see a goat with one really long horn is because it's talking about Alexander the Great. He was the one that led that empire. And he, uh, he was around the age of 32 or 33, history tells us, when he had conquered the known world at that time. It took him about 12 to 13 years as king to do it all. History says that he, you, you've maybe heard these famous words before, that Alexander the Great sat down and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. This is Daniel is seeing this before it plays out. Now, Alexander didn't have a son. He didn't have an heir to take the throne. So when he died, the Grecian Empire was divided up into guess how many kingdoms? Four. One long horn, broken, four little horns coming out of the head. Four kingdoms because he had four generals that ruled with him. Now, There's an interesting story. I told you a few weeks ago when we looked at Acts chapter 17 when I told you about Paul speaking to the Greeks uh, when he was going through Athens. And Paul told them, uh, 
uh, he, he was talking to them about how God knows when, the, when a kingdom's going to rise and when a kingdom is going to fall. <clears throat> I told you there was a story from history that I read that was very interesting. I want to remind this is a historic story. It's not in the Bible, okay? Um, but it's from a trusted Jewish historian by the name of Joseph, Josephus. You can find it in a Jewish encyclopedia. The story goes something to the, this is how jo- Josephus talks about the story, tells the story. Says that when Alexander the Great was reigning, when he was ruling, there was a high priest at the time in, uh, by the name of Jadua. And Jadua had a dream that he saw himself walking out and he was wearing a purple vest and he had this mentor on his head uh, that was engraved with the name of God on it, which would probably have been Yahweh. That's the way they reference God. And so he has this dream of him going out and welcoming Alexander the Great. All right? So after this dream, he begins to wait because he knows, he hears, they, they hear of the uh, conquering of Alexander the Great. They know he's coming that way. So he go, he's waiting on him to arrive. When they begin, when they find out Alexander the Great is on their way, uh, Jadua, the high priest, those in the court with him walk out with him dressed in this fine linen. Other people in the community walk out with him and they go out. And Josephus says that Alexander the Great bowed to honor the God of Jadua and this nation. Now, one of the generals that served with Alexander the Great thought this was unusual, and he asked him why he bowed in reverence to that priest. Those people should have been bowing to you. You're Alexander the Great. But Je- Josephus says that Alexander the Great told his general, I wasn't bowing in reverence to that man. I was bowing in reverence to his God because I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw that as I approached this area, there was a man in a purple vest and he had this thing on his head and he had people behind him and they were greeting me. And so Josephus tells the story that they then went into the temple and under the instruction of the priest, they they gave an offering to God and Alexander the Great was kind to them and then they opened the book of Daniel and showed him the visions that Daniel had. And so Alexander the Great then asked them, what can I do, what favor can I do for you? Because they believed he was the one that was going to overtake from the Persians, and he was. And he asked them, what favor can I do for you? So Jadua the priest asked him, please allow us to continue to honor the laws of our God and our forefathers as a nation, of which Alexander the Great did. It's a fascinating story. Now, again, it's not Bible. It's one that is listed in the encyclopedias of Jewish culture. But remember, I told you in Acts chapter 17, Paul, when he was talking to the Grecians, he told them, he said, there's a statue amongst many statues that you have on your land. And there's an inscription on one of those statues that says, to an unknown God. And Paul told him, I know that God. I want to tell you about that God. So I wonder, could it be that they put up an idol? to an unknown God because that happened. And Alexander the Great had a vision that came to him from God because it was leading up to him overtaking the Persian Empire. Just an interesting story that I thought was interesting and I wanted to share with you. Now, we see from these visions also in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, we see something happen from these horns. Now, Daniel chapter 7, remember, he has a vision of this indescribable beast. He doesn't name the beast like he named the other animals before, and this one he doesn't name. This was representative of Rome, and the 10 different horns are representative of the various kingdoms that would come from the kingdom of Rome. And one explanation that goes of why this was a beast that wasn't described as all the other animals like the other ones were before it is because this nation didn't just represent Rome, but it represented a type of kingdom and a type of kingdom that would come even in the future. A kingdom that carries the spirit of Babylon, a kingdom that carries... The, ultimately, the spirit of the beast that are spoken about in John's, Revel- John's vision that we see in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 talks about a dragon. This dragon is the devil, all right? 
Revelation chapter 13 speaks of two different beasts. One beast comes up out of the sea, one beast comes up out of the earth. The beast that comes up out of the uh, sea is called the Antichrist. Okay? This is the beast that, that draws the attention to himself. He is the Antichrist. Then the beast that comes from the earth is considered a prophet. He is one that works many signs and wonders on behalf of the Antichrist. Now, remember I told you several weeks ago, if you've been a part of the series, that the enemy wants to do nothing more than counterfeit the kingdom of God. What we see in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13 is the enemy's counterfeit trinity. You've got the dragon who is Satan trying to counterfeit God, the Antichrist who is trying to counterfeit Jesus Christ, and the, anti, or the prophet who is working signs and wonders who is counterfeiting the Holy Spirit. This is the enemy's counterfeit trinity. This is what we're seeing played out. Now, we get in these horns. We see the... In both of these visions, one little horn pop up from the horns. In Daniel chapter 8, we see that this little horn pops up out of the four horns, which would be from the Grecian Empire. Now, this is where I tell you that most people believe this is where you're getting what was prophetic to Daniel is is history, not just describing the empires overtaking one another, but history in regards to this little horn. Because around 170 B.C., there was a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus, Antiochus IV, who came up out of one of the sub-kingdoms of Greece. And he came just as it prophesied in verse 9 to try to overtake the south and overtake the east, which would have been Egypt and Israel. And he came into Jerusalem and he came into Israel. And history calls him the Hitler of the Old Testament. Because we know that Hitler was, did ruthless things to the Jews during the World War. Antiochus was brutal to the Jews when he went into Israel. He killed over 80,000 Jews. It didn't matter who you were, woman, child, man, 80,000 Jews. He began passing out coins to the people that had uh, inscribed on it, King Antiochus, God in the flesh. He set up an idol inside the Holy of Holies, inside the temple, and told the people that they were to worship it. He put on the altar of God a sacrifice that was swine flesh. It was a pig. It was considered an unclean animal. Nothing unclean touched the altar of God. He did this all just in spite of the Jews and who they were. He was brutal to them. He was an anti-Christ. The scripture would call it, we'll talk more about this next week, calls it the abomination of desolation. All right? So this was a picture of what would happen. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes did not die by any man. He died by an internal illness believed to have been related, uh, related to his stomach just like Daniel predicted. He died not by human hands. What man can't take down, God can. The spirit of the Antichrist, and the spirit of Antichrist has been, is still, and until Christ returns, will be at work in our age. And here's the goal of the Antichrist. It is to devour flesh, it is to deceive, and it is to exalt itself. That's its goal. And so with working in cooperation with the spirit of Babylon, because we see it described that way in the book of Revelation, we see it in Revelation chapter 17, that the, the, the spirit of the Antichrist is guided by the spirit of Babylon. So working in, in, in conjunction with those spirits together, that's exactly what they are trying to do to you and to me every day of our life. It wants to deceive you. It wants to get you to exalt yourself, ultimately to see your life destroyed. That's the goal. So Daniel chapter 8 tells us the pattern that we see of an antichrist that comes out of the Grecian empire. Daniel chapter 7 says the little little horn comes out of one of the ten horns on that final beast. This is believed to be representing the final antichrist. 
that would come, that Paul calls in 2 Thessalonians the man of lawlessness. But he also tells us that the power of lawlessness, just like John told us in his letter, has been at work and is already at work in our world. So there is a spirit at work, and ultimately there will be one who represents this in the end time. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, look at what Paul said to the church. He said, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we'll be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord had already begun. Because some this is now being written and happened after Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay? Antiochus Epiphanes would have come on this earth before Jesus Christ ever came to the earth. So he came before the first coming. All right? Paul goes on, he says, don't believe them, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God in every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. This is where some say that's why that's Antiochus, because he did that. That was a pattern, because in this world is a pattern, but in God is a promise. Paul is saying, we're going to reference this next week. Jesus even spoke to this. The abomination of desolation happened once, but the, the final one has not happened yet. And so Paul is given. So you read this and you're thinking, man, this is what, I'm so glad I came to church today. This is so encouraging. But Daniel's vision, Jesus himself, Paul, John's vision in in Revelation, they all tell us there is victory in Christ. When we see this, it's not meant to bring us hopelessness. It's meant to bring hope. Because look at what Paul goes on to say in verse 8 to his letter. He says, Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. All right, so there is hope. There is hope. And so Daniel is getting sick. He's getting worried. He's getting ill because of all these visions that he's seeing. But then there's the promise. And this is what every scholar agrees about. That even in an age of an antichrist, even with the spirit of antichrist all around, the ancient of days still reigns. The ancient of days rules. You can have hope. You can have a hope for a future. Even if everything around you is the darkest it's ever been, you can have hope for a future. Look at what Daniel says he sees. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient one, the ancient of days, sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. And then look at verse 10. And a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session and the books were open. Listen, the ancient of days, seated on his throne, surrounded by his army of angels. And it says that he's, he's on this throne with wheels of fire. How awesome is that? God's been tricking out his ride long before Fast and Furious or anybody before Fast and Furious. He has got wheels of fire on his throne, all right? Now, the, be- the, the imagery of this, what this tells us is that, that God, God is always on his throne. It doesn't matter where he goes. His throne's got wheels. And he is always on his throne. He is never off his throne. He may be standing in front of his throne, but his throne is right there so he can take his seat whenever he wants to. He's got his throne. He is ever present. He is always there. He is not distant. He is not uninvolved. He is a part of your life. He is there. Now, now, Daniel's name, Daniel's name means God is judge or God has judged. So what Daniel is seeing played out is he is seeing the meaning of his name played out right in front of him. Because it says that God, the ancient of days, opens the book and court is in session. What is he doing? He's judging. 
The ancient of days has been judging since the beginning of time, continually judging and will judge. Now, we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to think about being judged. We like to tell people, don't judge me. You can't judge me. We'll even say, only God can judge me. I want to ask, are you sure you want to say that? See, we want to take the Bible and we want to take this book and we want, to live, we want to read it as just a bunch of practical tips that help us live a better life. And there's, that is true. It does that. But the point of this book is to point us to Jesus Christ, to give us an understanding of the one who is the only way to God the Father, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, to get us to understand the grace and the mercy of God and to get us to understand the true meaning of the judgment of God. Now, look at what the author of Hebrews, we're, we're, we're coming to an end, but look at what the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Look at what he said. And just as each person is destined to die once, you got one, one death, so there's no reincarnation, there's none of that stuff. Just as each person is destined to die once, after that comes judgment. But here's the thing, though. When you are in Christ, you don't have to fear a judgment of damnation. That judgment is meant for that dragon, the devil, those beasts, the antichrist, the prophet, and anyone who embraces and refuses to let go of the spirit of Babylon and spirit of antichrist in their life. But look at what he says in Hebrews 9 verse 28. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He'll come again, not to deal with, or not to judge you with damnation for your sins when you put yourself in him, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. And then look at what Daniel saw, Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. Verse 14, he was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It'll never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. The son of man is the, is, is, a, is the phrase that Jesus used most often to describe himself. 80 times throughout the gospels, you see Jesus use the phrase, the son of man. One of the greatest was when Matthew and Mark tell us about this. It's when he went before Caiaphas, the high priest, after he was arrested, right before he was taken to be uh, tri, uh, put on a cross. Okay, And Caiaphas looks at him, the high priest looks at him, and he says, are you the son of God? Are you Jesus Christ? Are you the Messiah? And if, you, if this is in a movie, this is when you cue the music. Because this is like, oh, 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 man. Jesus looks at him and he quotes Daniel chapter 7. And he says, yes, in fact, I am. And in the future, you will see the son of man coming at the right hand of God. Coming on a cloud from heaven. So these guys hear this. They know the book of Daniel. And so they're thinking, wait a minute, you're quoting Daniel. And if you're saying, that means you're saying that about you and you're talking about the ancient of days. Well, where does that put us? They know exactly where it put them. Not in a good place. But Jesus Christ, he is the one who comes to reign and to rule. And we don't have to fear judgment. The man judges to expose Jesus Christ doesn't judge to expose. One of the most beautiful pictures of this is when the woman caught in the act of adultery is brought to Jesus and he looks at her and then he looks at all of them around. He says, all right, well, if you ain't got no sin, you throw a stone at her. And then he kneels down, he writes, we don't know what he's writing. Nobody throws a stone. Jesus Christ, who doesn't have any sin, he could have stoned her, but not. He looks at her and he speaks to her with love and he speaks to her with grace and he speaks to her with mercy and he says, I don't judge you in that way either. I don't stone you and I forgive you. But not only do I forgive you, here's my word to you. Go and sin no more. In other words, let your life be changed by that grace and by that mercy. Don't live in that because you want to avoid the judgment of fire. Don't live in that. Walk away in his grace. Walk away in his mercy and receive it. God, Jesus doesn't come to judge you and to expose you. He came to scorn shame and to offer you grace and to offer you mercy. See, Daniel 7 
John's revelations in the book of Revelation, it tells us that these beasts came from the earth, but God's kingdom came from heaven. This is what we need to know. The kingdom we need doesn't come from this world. The kingdom we need comes from the heavenly realms. Our, we can't say this enough in this church. Our hope does not come from anything established in this world. Our hope is found in an unseen world and in Jesus Christ alone. Listen, you may not be kept from pain, but you don't have to panic because God works through every situation for his purpose. Real quick, you want to know how he worked through the purposes of all those empires? When the Medes and the Persians overtook the Babylons, the Persians were the one that sent the, the exiles back to Jerusalem. They assisted in rebuilding the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was key to Jesus' ministry when he walked this earth. When the Grecian Empire overtook the Medes and the Persians, you know what the Grecian Empire did? They formed one world, known world language at the time. It was Greek. You know what the majority of the New Testament is written in? It's written in Greek. So the majority of people were able to see and read the words of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Rome overtook the empire, you know what Rome did? They built a lot of roads, which made it easy to travel. So you know what that meant? It, was made, it, it made it a lot easier for the word of God and the gospel of God to travel throughout the known world in that time. God knows what he's doing. He places every man in charge because he has a purpose. There is a, his sovereign will will not be thwarted. The enemy can't stop it. It doesn't matter what antichrist arises out from wherever they arise out from. It doesn't matter what prophet comes and tries to deceive people. It doesn't matter where they come from. God is God. He sits on his throne. That is awesome. And he judges and rules over this world. Now listen, that, that fire, it is a fire of judgment. But here's the great thing about Revelation tells us that from God's throne doesn't just doesn't come fi- uh, rivers of fire. It comes rivers of healing water. Yes. So where those who are opposed to God will receive a fire, a judgment of fire, those who are in Christ receive healing grace and mercy. The goal of the spirit of Babylon and the spirit of Antichrist, it will always be to destroy you. And where, yes, it's probably going to get progressively harder to be a follower of Christ. Not probably, it will be. Progressively harder to be a follower of Christ. You don't need your affirmation as a follower of Christ from the world. All the affirmation you need comes from God and your heavenly father. We are but a dot on a timeline, but he surrounds it all. And where we might be surrounded by a spirit of Babylon and a spirit of Antichrist, God has given us a spirit that is greater than any spirit in this world. And no weapon formed against us will prosper. And we have been given authority from the sovereign King, Lord Jesus Christ over it all to go into the world and to make disciples of Jesus. One last verse and then we're we're ending. Daniel 7, 27. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will last forever and all rulers will serve and obey him. Jesus taught us to pray. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, even now as it is in heaven. So your worship and your obedience to this great king, it doesn't have to wait till then to start. It starts now. God, let your will be done on this earth now as it is in heaven. Stand with me this morning. just want us to take just a few moments as we wrap up today, as we usually do, to focus our attention on the Father and just ask His Spirit to fill us, to encourage us, to empower us, to strengthen us because we are in a world that is up against 
a spirit that wants to devour, deceive, and destroy. But we have a God who's given us a spirit that wraps us in grace and mercy and strengthens us for his purposes. So Father, we just ask you now, as we close out in these moments, and we just tune our heart to you, that you would just line us up with your word and help us to honor you. Fill us with your spirit, God, because we need it in a dark world. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccambin.com, go to our contact page. You'll find the link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803 803- 676-7566 and we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.